Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am joined by Martin, a uh, creepy guy on the side of the road in his car, Willis. <laughs> well, you better explain why. Because well, that... you're trying to find a good signal. That's right. And but, I almost pulled into a cemetery where there was a good signal, but I just <laughs> it just didn't feel right. Would have been a little too creepy. creepy. Yeah. yeah. A little bit. Well, well you know, um, uh, it sounds great, so you're doing good. Good. I'm not going to move an inch. Do not move an inch. But, yeah, you know how it is kind of creepy. Now, I know in real estate people do this a lot because you get a, a message from a client. You don't want to text or, or stuff, so you pull over. But it can be kind of creepy. I don't know why. I always think it's weird when you see, probably from just watching too many TV shows, when you see mm. someone parked on the side of the road, it's like, is that Serial a man in killer. black? Ooh, yeah. yeah, or something like that. Mm. Wow. I'm wondering if well, that's someone up to no good. It could be just someone trying to do a radio show. Yep. And you that's never know. the case here. Yeah. Mm. So <laughs> let's get into the radio show. Let me talk about my guest today. I'm very excited about the guest we've got back. We've had him on before. Um, and it turns out it was about a year ago. And that is Mark O'Connell. He is the author of the book, The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs. Mm, I don't know if this one guy did it, but certainly he may be probably the most influential person, um, which is Dr. J. Allen Hynek. He was an astronomer hired by the Air Force uh, to investigate UFOs. Well, allegedly investigate, but um, they they essentially wanted him to debunk the UFO uh, phenomena yeah. and situations. But he was, even though he was a skeptic and thought it was all goofy to begin with, he was a good scientist in that he was like, you know, well, he w truly wanted to investigate. And eventually, once he did you know, uh, saw that there was something really to all of this. So I recently wrote a story about this in um, Den of Geek and a little bit that I led people into from OpenMinds.tv because, and this is why we have Mark on again, is to talk about this upcoming television show, Project Blue Book, that's going to be about Project Blue Book, which was, the you know, the Air Force's last investigation into UFOs, and about Hynek in particular. In fact, it focuses on... On Hynek, so that's exciting. You know, it's funny when you, when you talk to people about old time cases that were there. You know, they all they always it always seems like Hynek comes up. Oh yeah, he came like I spoke to Calvin Parker from the Pascagoula mm -hmm. uh, abduction incident last week, and he said, "Oh yeah, you know, J. Allen Hynek showed up, and he was all over the place. He really, you know, he really did do a thorough job and really took it serious enough." to go to places like, you know, where this incident happened and find out the real story. Yeah, he did some field work. He got uh, out there, out and about to figure this out. And uh, um, we're going to talk about some of the cool kind of field work that he did here with Mark O'Connell in a bit. Yeah, yeah. and Exciting. Yeah, so I'm glad that... You know, he has a legacy that's going to be, I hope they do a good job. It looks like, you know, after um, after what you're saying, it seems like they're they're doing a pretty good job, you know, portraying him. And uh, hopefully they'll do a, a decent job with him and his character. Yes, I hope so, too. 
So we'll see. It's great actor Aiden. To, I forget his last name is uh, the actor who he is from. He was Littlefinger from uh, Game of Thrones. So oh, he, he was oh. a, one you love to hate in Game of Thrones. Right. I think I know who you mean. Yeah, I think he was um, in Harry Potter as well. Like most British actors, it seems, mm-hmm. played some role in Harry Potter. So he's a British actor, actually. I believe so, yeah. I should look it up. He's Irish. He's from Dublin. Irish? How about that? This always makes me feel bad because he's a good-looking dude. I would have guessed he's at least my age or around my age. He's older than I am. Wow. And uh, he looks wow. better. That's what makes me a man. <laughs> well, you know, uh, when you're an actor, you really have to keep yourself groomed. So That's we'll just- true. Yeah, we'll have to just leave it there. That's a good point. So that's really yeah. exciting. So that's what's up. Also, um, a couple other things. There's some openminds.tv stories, but we'll actually uh, let you get into news, and, and we'll bring some of those up back that, uh, then. But there's something else I'm doing. I'm not sure if you noticed this. So uh, on your show, Podcast UFO, I am, you know, you do it on YouTube live, and I've got this background that's pretty cool, right? That um, oh my goodness, yeah, I show up with. Well, I got that not just for your show, partially, but also because I wanted to do some uh, YouTube or some live video type of things, and I finally have got around to it. So I've started up Ooh. UFOs seriously live. So every Thursday. At 6 p.m. Arizona time, which is actually Arizona doesn't change times. All of you guys, most That's right. other states change. So right now we're aligned with Pacific. But um, so at, at 6 p.m. Thursdays, I'm going to try to do this every week, uh, a live video just to kind of talk. There's always something to talk about. So just to talk to my audience about stuff. So I did this the first time last Thursday. You can find the video on YouTube, and uh, and hopefully you can join us live sometimes. Uh, I, 6 p.m. Thursday well, is what I'm sticking with now because I, I think that's a good time. I may adjust that uh, as time goes on, but I want to stick to a regular kind of time. And, uh, yeah, so I did a YouTube live the other day. Wow, that's great. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's real true. I can tell you from doing YouTube now for... I don't know. Has it been a year? I'm not really sure, but at least it's really, it, yeah, it's really hard to find the sweet spot and what time is good for, mm. because you may be, you know, you may be catching people at, you know, getting off of work at some time zone, but over in Europe, they're saying, why don't you do it a little bit earlier? Or, yeah. And then in the West coast time, they're saying, why don't you do it a little bit later? <laughs> it's really hard to yeah. find things to do it. Yeah. But I wish you luck on that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, that's the hard part because, you know, we get listeners from all over the place. And, of course, since most of the populations are on the coasts, that's the hard part. So finding that good spot is difficult. So hopefully this is a time people can work with. Yeah, excellent. The other thing I'm doing. Thank you. The other thing I'm doing is I'm taking this podcast and putting it on YouTube as well, something I probably should have been doing for a long time, but others were doing it. Um, the reason mm. I'm doing it now is because, you know, um, people may realize we've had a lack of content on our Open Mind YouTube. Um, essentially, the Open Mind staff is down to me, whereas uh, mm. not too long ago, we had a video editor and, and, and a studio as people know because i saw all of the stuff that we would produce over the years and so now it, it's mostly just myself however um i i have over the last few months you know collected some some more gear and everything and so i not only have my setup here you know my podcast setup with where i can also do you know the videos like for your show but I also have some cool gear so I can do remote and do some interviews uh, wherever I go. And I, I vowed it. I'm just whenever I travel, wherever I go, I'm going to be bringing my camera, my microphone, and I'm going to be ready for interviews at any moment. Wow. I am envi- envious. 
You are. And uh, yeah, well, last year, you remember I was in Russia for th- two months, mm. which is way too long, by the way. Yeah, um, that's so, a long time. Yeah. This year, I'm going just for two weeks, but I'm um, going to be in Austria and um, and Russia as well. So, cool. Uh, um, so I I don't have I can't I don't have the capabilities you have. Um, I'll have to look into that because I think yeah. it would be great to go to different locations and be able to have the you know the camera on board and yeah and um, it, sh- it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, my my light version of my equipment, the lightest version, is literally plugging a professional mic into my cell phone and doing the video, the interview with that. In fact, you know, this is similar, wow. minus the mic, unfortunately, to what we did when I had my recent interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, was just with my phone. And it turned out really good. So, I mean, the phone could do some really cool stuff. Now I've got... Um, so yeah, so that's going to be my easiest version, but, uh, I think that'll work out pretty good. Wow. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing what you can do with all this stuff. Yeah, so. exactly. A lot of fun. So yeah, that's some new stuff people can look forward to and hopefully well over time and, and I'll get some really cool interviews when I meet some of these, uh, people that I see here at hither and tither. You ready to do some news? Yeah, let's do some news. Well, I would like to talk about, um, it was just this last Sunday, we had, has really not much to do with UFOs, but really, um, it could be a UFO to someone else, and that's <laughs> NASA launched a uh, solar probe, a mission to basically mm. kiss the sun, and um, I'm catching it right now on uh, space.com, um, and it, it was uh, written by a gentleman named Mike wall over there and so basically what happened is uh this probe launched it it delayed a day and then it's called the uh, nasa's parker solar probe and it lifted off on sunday um august 12th at 3 31 a.m that's eastern standard time and so it launched up and have i watched it it um it was a successful launch and so this is really interesting you know it's going to basically be uh, trying to get some information from, you know, our nearest star, the sun. And it talks about how close it's going to go. And, you know, at first it doesn't seem like it's really that close. It's going to be like, uh, I think it's uh, something like two and a half uh, million kilometers away from it. But you think about how far we are away. They're just trying to get more information about the sun itself. And because it's really you know, mysterious. And I, I never knew this, but you know, the winds or the solar winds, those can go something like um, over, I think I'm over a million miles an hour. Yeah. A lot of them are, are you know, they're to, killer you winds. 800,000. 800, Literally. Guess so yeah, yeah. They're, they're radiation that will kill you. I mean, and, and it's a big concern. Um, and it, it was actually, yeah, it because if we're going to go travel in space for long distances, that shielding from the radiation from the the solar winds is, is a big issue. Um, the ISS and our satellites are within our force field. The Earth creates its own like force field shield, kind of with its magnetic poles. And if you ever saw it, the Earth creates these big magnetic. Um, fields that that act as a a shield but the sun blitzes it and pushes it on the side that's towards the sun way back but luckily enough where the earth stays protected um that's one of the reasons we have life here and uh but other planets like mars don't have that and once you're outside of our our shield you're you're exposed to the radiation they believe that Mars did at one time, but lost, but lost it. And, yeah. um, you know, that could be the reason of the uh, evaporation of the atmosphere. I mean, that's exactly what would happen if yeah. there was one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what they so. feel. I mean, there's a lot that gets really complicated. And I think it's right now, you know, the, the, the makeup and the geo- geology of our planet, because we have an active volcanic planet and like a hard central core and, the spinning creates the fields, and so yeah. So unfortunately, Mars no longer has one. So that's one of the concerns. 
But uh, it and is a concern with space travel. And, right. you know, you reminded me of something, too, because topics like this, I'm going to be covering even more in UFOs seriously. Like I talk about in the show, it's like, you know, I mean it like, well, it, it's kind of a triple meaning where, you know, people often will say, you know, be like, UFOs, seriously, you know, <laughs> or mm-hmm. and our reply would be like, UFOs, seriously. Seriously, mm. dude, I'm talking about UFOs, but also taking the subject seriously. So looking at more of the, the hard information, um, you know, and what research is out there, including in topics that relate, such as the search for extraterrestrial life and um, space mm-hmm. travel and, of course, the space weather which is actually a thing, um, mostly to do with the sun, and that's what this this probe is for, is to so we can more accurate accurately predict space weather. So when these big solar waves come, they just don't completely destroy us. Yeah, I know. I've heard a lot of times the you know astronauts that went to the moon just had really good timing. If they had gone like a few weeks later or something like that. They could have yeah. gotten radiated, you know, yeah. from from, uh, uh, from the corona thing. mass ejection or whatever you call those things. Yeah. But, well, there's um, a couple other things to talk about. Yeah, sure. Before we run out of time, if you don't mind. Did you have any other stories or? No, no. I forgot we're running out of time already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about a couple of stories, too, that I think are big. The first one that's more UFO related is um, this is the latest to the Stars Academy news, which is they've hooked up with um, Earth Tech. Now, uh, this organization they already were pretty much partnered with. It's ran by Hal Putov, who is currently part of To the Stars, uh, this organization called Earth Tech International. One of the other people who people who work on this is Dr. Eric Davis. And, of course, Eric Davis and Hal Putov have been, been working together for, for many, many years, uh, including on different UFO and, and paranormal projects, including on projects with Bigelow, such as the Skinwalker Ranch. So they've what they've done, however, here is they've started this project called the Adam Research Project. And mm-hmm. it's a formal partnership between the two where they say they will um, research and analyze any anomalous material um, that anyone wants to submit to them. So if you think you've got a piece of a UFO, they'll spend all of the money and find the labs to do the research. Now, first, there was a Q&A. They posted the story originally on July 26th, and then on August 2nd, they did kind of a follow-up Q&A where they answered more details. Um, but essentially, they go through a process where they do some research to make sure you have, you know, proper... um um chain of custody and and you know it's a mm-hmm. credible situation before they move to the analysis stage but yeah that's uh, something to the stars academy is starting up which is pretty uh, which is interesting it's cool i mean i've i've helped people an- work to get things analyzed before and it's very difficult because you have to find someone these tests cost money you have to find a yes. lab willing to do it and not only that, once a lab does analysis, then you need someone to essentially translate that data. Someone who That's looks right. at the data to tell you what you got. The lab won't necessarily do that for you. So it's a complicated process and something that these guys will do. One, another interesting thing uh, I, I made note here is that one of the things that they're trying to figure out is... Um, the space time metric. So they mm-hmm. they will look into whether this material can answer any questions, quote, answer any questions about space time manipulation, unquote. So wow. isn't that weird? And it was one of, it was a weird question out of nowhere. So it seems as though they feel um and, and they have some material. At least Elizondo's, you know, Pentagon group uh, was able to 
in the New York Times story says, you know, Bigelow had some material they investigated. So I'm wondering, that material they have, did, did, for some reason, do they believe this material has something to do or can manipulate space time? So, um, well, really it weird. Would be a, it certainly could be pieces to a puzzle. And yeah. also for, for um, the question of how, if these things do come from out there, you know, the, the question has always been, how do they get from out there to, to here? Right. And, you know, may, maybe they have something figured out, which is really fascinating. Yeah, really weird. So we've only got a couple minutes, so I want to get to the last story. Oh, sure. And that is the Space Force. So I posted a story. Uh, I wrote a story for Den of Geek, but I also kind of wrote a, a short thing in the introduction that kind of points you, then points you to the Den of Geek ar- article, where I got into the details of this Space Force. Why a Space Force? What the heck are they talking about? And, and of course, the headline I used for openminds.tv is the headlines on people's mind is, will this new Space Force combat aliens? And the mm. answer to that question is, historically, this is actually, the Space Force is a conversation that's been going on for literally decades. Um mm. At the beginning of this conversation, and it was all about how do we protect our satellites? So this question's been asked ever since we put them up there. And ever since we put them up there, of course, we have a growing and growing um, dependency on satellites and the data oh, that sure. we receive from them. So, and the military does right now in modern warfare, they have real time data that they get where they can see what's going on, you know, weather communications they rely on these satellites so what if somebody did something to him in 2007 china actually created a missile that could blow a satellite up they blew up one of their own satellites russia's working on that now so actually because of those concerns there was a space force already created and it's called u.s air force space command it was under the air force the argument, mm. the difference now is essentially that the administ- the White House and, and some politicians are saying, well, this threat is too big and the Air Force isn't dedicating enough of their budget. That's why we need a third, uh, a n- brand new branch of the military to deal with this. But it's a lot more complicated mm. than that because even though the Air Force is kind of the lead, there's, there's parts of this space program in all of the branches and very diff- various different um, organizations, governmental organizations. So it'd be extremely complicated to bring it out and expensive. So the questions are, where would we have the money? And for the most part, the military, including the defense secretary, are saying, no way, we can't afford this and it's not necessary anyway. So that's where this has all come about. It's kind of this long conversation that's gone on that cr- this conversation created the Space Command to begin with. And now uh, Pence just re- recently said, we're going to have a U.S. Space Command, but it's going to be a national. It's not going to be just Air Force. So they do have to get approval for Congress before it gets uh, created. But the White House has just announced they want to try to move forward before getting approval. So that's what the Space Force I think it would is be all the, about. It would be the first of its kind, really, in the world, right? I don't, I don't no, not at all. Else. No. Russia already has – Russia and China both already have one. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. pretty so, much every yeah, government to, has one. Wow. So we don't want to slip behind and, you know, it's like a space race in a way. We never want to, you know, falter when uh, – when we've done so well in the beginning, you know. Yeah, that's a big issue. Although we're already kind of behind the 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 gun, behind the starting off on the second foot right now because we're having to catch up with Russia when it comes to cargo and ferrying people to the space station. Right. We're relying on Boeing and SpaceX to do that, and they've already got yeah. their programs rolling, but they're not going to be ready till early 2019. Um, and then now it's Russia and China want to go to the moon. Uh, we need to catch up so we can go to the moon. Um, we're playing catch up in, in some respects when it comes to some of this, but um, yeah, it's very political. I mean, when it comes to NASA especially, and what we're doing that way, all those monies are so political that they get bounced around and that's what makes it difficult for nasa to have a focus on on what to do next because politicians are changing their mind all the time so 
That's, That's what's right. going on. All right, All we're right. out of time. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Yep. Thanks for joining us with the news. Remember, you can check out Martin and on Podcast UFO. Let's go ahead and talk to our guest, Mark O'Connell. Welcome back to Open Mind UFO Radio. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am here, happy to be back here with Mark O'Connell, the author of The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs, which is a lot of fun. Um, Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, Alejandro. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know... uh, I had mentioned this. I'm doing this new like live YouTube video thing, and I had mentioned how – well, I mentioned this a lot. Running into Seth Shostak, who works with a um, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, their lead mm-hmm. scientist. And he always uses this statement. If, he, if there was something to UFOs, astronomers would be interested. And what I find shocking and kind of ironic, and, and if he paid attention, is that really um, – it was an astronomer who started this whole thing, like <laughs> yeah, exactly. your title talks about. Uh, yeah, exa- you're exactly right. That's very ironic. And I think, you know, what, what you're, that quote you're attributing to Seth Shostak just shows the, the dangers of making blanket statements. Uh, you know, I, I, he's, he's a smart guy. He knows a lot about mm-hmm. uh, the field of astronomy, but f- to say... To just make a blanket statement that no astronomers are interested is, I mean, we all know that that's, that's not true at all. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm surprised he would make that kind of statement. But, you know, this topic tends to, um, t- tends to bring out a lot of blanket statements from a lot of people. Yeah. Right. On all sides. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, um, you know, and I want to stick on this, actually. I'm so fascinated with every aspect of Hynek. But, um, and I do want to get into, of course, this upcoming television show about Hynek, essentially, called Project Blue Book, which is really exciting. But um, Hynek was also uh, very interested in astronomers and their perspectives on UFOs as well. In fact, he did a, a, a report on this. Yeah, in in the early 1950s, um, when he was really starting to become uh, very deeply involved in Project Blue Book, working for the Air Force, he was sent out on kind of a secret mission to survey his colleagues in the world of astronomy and find out how many of them... He wasn't asking them if they believed in UFOs. He was asking them if they thought that UFOs were important enough to um, be the subject of scientific research. Uh, And of course, he also wanted to know if any of those astronomers had actually seen anything that they would um, describe as a UFO. And he spent spent, um, several months, I believe, he started out at an international astronomers conference in Vancouver, I believe, and then just sort of wound his way down the West Coast visiting a bunch of major observatories. And when all was said and done, I believe he had surveyed close to 50 astronomers. Um, and about 11% of them had uh, had seen something in the sky that they couldn't explain. So that makes it a UFO, officially. Um, and several of those involved, several of those 11%, um, expressed an interest in studying the phenomenon But most of them put in a qualifier. Most of them said, I'd be interested in researching this, but only if I had intellectual cover, only if I could keep it a secret, (laughs) basically, Mm, from from my colleagues and my students and my bosses, Um, which I always thought was kind of interesting. People people are in private. They're willing to say, yes, I'm interested and I've seen something, but, you know, put them on the record and their story often changes. So, so Heineck thought that was a pretty respectable number of astronomers to, to be, uh, you know, number one, admitting 
that they had seen something odd. And number two, uh, you know, ex expressing an interest in, in studying the topic, uh, you know, under the proper circumstances. Heineck was pretty impressed with that. 11% is... That's that's a pretty reasonable number if he, especially when you're looking at the group he was surveying, you know, very serious scientists who, you know, we can just assume they're going to be very very reluctant to, um, you know, to to put their name to something as dubious as a UFO study, you know, they're they would be naturally pretty cautious about that, and for 11 percent of them to raise their hands and say, yeah, let's do this, that was kind of that was kind of a big deal to Heineck. Yeah, and I think that is a big deal. I mean, like you said, especially given the nature of the people that he's talking to. I mean, Seth Shostak has a great point that astronomers are very familiar with, um, you know, cosmic uh, objects and, and looking at the sky and identifying what's in the sky. So they're, they are good observers. Um, what he fails to realize is that really they're – their interest, or at least the, the and the amount of sightings they had, were really kind of at par with the general public, which I think was was one of the arguments Heineck made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, this is just making me think of uh, Heineck's involvement in the late 1950s in the space in the budding space program when he was uh, hired to establish the world's first global satellite tracking system in anticipation of the U.S. Uh, launching the first artificial satellite into orbit. We all know how that ended. The Russians beat us <laughs> with Sputnik. Um, but in the meantime, though, Hynek had put together this global network of observatories and volunteer mm. sky watchers to scan the skies looking for signs of this artificial satellite. And although he never made a big deal about it or talked about it much, Hynek was on record as saying that, yes, Many of our observers saw things as they were watching the sky. They saw things that didn't belong there and that they couldn't explain. So, so that you know, here's here's the situation. It's not just it's not just you know a handful of astronomers. Now we're talking about thousands of observers around the globe watching for watching for Sputnik and seeing strange lights that absolutely were not <laughs> an earthly satellite um you know showing up in their in their viewfinders it's pretty interesting mhm mm fascinating so a lot has happened and and i guess my final answer would be that this really is a very strong let alone more information like uh peter Sturuck and and some others who who have done some more inventories with uh astronomers regarding ufo's but this is really a strong answer to Seth Shostak's question, which is, you know, Heineck answered that question from the beginning, from a very long time ago. An astronomer himself who started all of this up, um, certainly astronomers are interested in having sightings. Yeah, absolutely. It kind of reminds me of the Drake equation. You know, if, if there are extraterrestrial intelligences out there, where are they? Why haven't we spotted them yet? Well, you know, that's you, – you can't really argue that very well one way or the other. It doesn't prove anything. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's an interesting discussion. But, yeah, exactly. Because um, even if you could prove that there isn't a single astronomer – in the world interested in the UFO <laughs> phenomenon, that doesn't mean the phenomenon doesn't exist. It proves right. nothing. Right, right. Now, it's been a while since we talked, and there's a lot that's happened. Um, several things, even before we get to Blue Book. Of course, Blue Book, I think, will hopefully have a positive impact on your book. But one of the things, of course, that's happened is in December, um, it's been announced the government's been researching UFOs. Mm -hmm. um, and... I think that, to me, it seems like there's been a bit of, of uh, a surge of a group of people out there now looking for credible information. And certainly, uh, your book would be one of those sources of information for them. Um, how has that affected your book, and how has the, the book been doing? The book has been doing pretty well, and I think you, you're, you're right. All this, um, anytime UFOs capture the headlines... 
that's going to send people to the bookstore and send them to, to Amazon looking for something new to read on the topic. And yes, so it's definitely been helpful to my book. We're really happy with the sales. I haven't had an update for several months, so I don't re- I don't have a current number. Um, but I do I do know that. Uh, now I haven't. Oh, I should have checked this before the show. I forgot to do this. But a couple weeks ago, for several days at least. Uh, the Close Encounters Man was the number one UFO book on Kindle, on Kindle sales at Amazon. So, ah, cool. Uh, and you know, being Kindle's great because they don't have to buy paper, they don't have to <laughs> right. buy ink. So, I mean, what they had done, Amazon had put it on sale for a dollar ninety nine for the Kindle copy. But like I say, there's n- there's no infrastructure cost, so that's you know. That's pure profit, so I, I don't mind them cutting the price at all if it means that a whole lot more people are going to get a look at the book. So I was really happy with that. Mm-hmm. You don't get to be number one very often, and it's pretty cool when it happens. And I think I think that some of that uh, bump might have come from the presentations at uh, at Comic Con about about the new Blue Book TV show. Mm-hmm. They, they seem to be pretty closely aligned uh, time wise. So uh, so yeah, all all this. All this current news about UFOs is definitely good for the book. It keeps keeps the book in front of people's uh, in front of people's eyes, and um, it opens the door to uh, interesting new projects. Um, so I love it. Mm-hmm. And how has uh, I, I'm not sure if you you've been doing a lot of like mainstream interviews regarding your book, um, you know, non UFO uh, radio shows and stuff like that. And if you have, um, has the response changed at all the way that uh, at least the interviewers approach you well yeah and i can give you a really good example um just about a year ago just after the book had first come out and i was doing a whole lot of uh radio and and tv appearances i i was invited to do a segment on a um a public affairs show on chicago's uh public tv station wttw it's a show called uh chicago tonight and it's you know they they normally do political news so i was very surprised that they mm. wanted me on but they were interested in the connection between uh dr heineck and northwestern university and university of illinois chicago or university of chicago uh you know and the simple the fact that that heineck was a, a chicago guy right from the start so they were interested in the local angle and that was i had i had a lot of fun in that interview it was just me and the news in the news guy and he asked really good questions. There was no, you know, you never know walking into a, 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 an interview with sort of a, a, a mainstream media outlet. You mm-hmm. never know what the what the attitude of the interviewer is going to be. Right. Uh, but this guy was he was great. He was respectful. He was uh, he he didn't take any he didn't make any cheap shots. He seemed genuinely interested in the story. That was all great. But then last December, after the news broke about the uh, you know the the the, the apparent sighting uh, off in the Pacific involving the USS Nimitz, they invited me back again. And this time, instead of just me, they had me uh, alongside a, an astronomer from uh, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Cool. So yeah, so so the second appearance after that news broke about the Nimitz case. Um, Instead of just having the UFO guy on, they had, you know, they had sort of a two opposing viewpoints on. And it turned out the astronomer was really a great guy. We had a lot of fun talking and, and ended up agreeing on a lot of things because he was actually, um, he was actually uh, genuinely interested in the USO, UFO phenomenon um, and, you know, wasn't really quick to dismiss it. So I ended up, I thought we ended up having a really, really fun and interesting conversation on that show. But, but I think that shows you how, how, you know, the coverage shifted after the events in December. Um, mm-hmm. People really wanted to talk about it, but they wanted to bring in a couple of different viewpoints. And I think it's, I think probably there was, um, my guess was at the time, and still is, that it was sort of a comfort level thing. Like if, if this mainstream news show was going to talk about this subject, you know, it's one thing to talk about a book about a guy who died 30 years ago. <laughs> it's, it's another thing to report, be reporting on a real-time UFO incident. And, you know, I, I, I think there was just a certain amount of um, 
cautiousness involved that they the you know the the TV station just wanted to make sure they had a couple different viewpoints so they wouldn't be seen to be leaning one way or another. That was my that was my take on it. Mhm. Which is fair and I think that's interesting too because um you know representing the history of someone very credible like Dr. Heineck gives you a, a lot of information, very credible information that you can impart, even if you do have a, a skeptical astronomer there. Um, so, and, and his perspective, I think, is also important because, uh, I guess, you know, this new program that existed and the government's involvement also gives us, you know, some more tools in our toolbox to demonstrate that, you know, there are important people that take this stuff seriously, uh, not just, you know, fringe, wild-eyed believers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly um, opens the discussion up, I think, to, and brings new voices in, which is always a good thing. Um, so yeah, I, th I think all in all, it's great to have those conversations kind of, uh, jump started and energized by this kind of, by this kind of event. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm assuming you would feel that Heineck, of course, is one of the very important stories when it comes to, um, UFOs or ufology. Would you say maybe he's the most important story? Oh boy. Um, I, I don't know if that's the case now, 30 years after he passed away. I think that, um, I, well, I know for a fact that a lot of people who, um, who study this phenomenon and who are, you know, deeply interested in it, a lot of people still hold Heineck in high regard. Some of them still hold Heineck in, in low regard, you know, for various reasons and uh, various incidents in his career. Um, so I think I think to to some people he is still the preeminent authority. I'm not sure if you could say that you know globally in in, in the current world of ufology. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who would take that place. Honestly, there are, there, you know there are a lot of people I think who would probably be in contention for it. Um, I, th I think I think Heineck has earned himself a permanent place in that discussion, though. You know I will say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an, there's. No doubt, and I, I was curious because, um, yeah, I was wondering if maybe you'd say definitely he's the most important. But <laughs> well, uh, of course, I want to say that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and just you know, because he, he is very important, and I, I, you know, thinking about it, and even when asking the question, I, I would argue that maybe he is, and that's what makes it exciting that, um, the the History Channel has chosen him as their main character for this television show. And I guess from what you've seen thus far, uh, were you contacted by the producers, and, and how do you feel about the show? Um, I have to be a little careful what I say here. Yes, okay. I was contacted by a producer from the show about a year ago, um, and he wanted to... Um, he just wanted to talk in general about Heineck's career, and as he put it, he wanted to try to put some of their research into the proper context. Um, and so I talked with him. Um, basically, um, I I, uh, I was willing to t talk to him, but not really willing to share a whole lot of uh, my research with him. Um, it seemed to me and my agent at the time that this was – this was potentially leading up to an offer to work on the program, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it didn't lead to that. Which I still, uh, I'm, I'm not. It's unclear to me why. Um, but in the long run, I, th I think it's okay that it didn't turn into an offer of, of employment because I think they're telling a very different story than I would have wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's my only involvement with the show was having that one conversation with this one producer who um you know was was trying to get free inf information essentially and that's as far as it went when I wouldn't give him any free information that ended the conversation so mm -hmm. so uh you know so I am somewhat biased in my analysis of the show I I I'm interested to see what the show is going to be like of course the the trailer is out now so we're getting a few glimpses of things um, I, 
I don't recognize any of what I see in that trailer as, <laughs> as things, things that I uh, know of in Hynek's, in Hynek's life and his history. So um, I'm a little curious about how they arrived at, at uh, some, how they made some of their decisions. Um, there is something interesting, though, that I, it took me a couple times looking at this image to notice that there was a little visual pun in there's a there's a photo that's now being used to publicize the show. You you probably recognize it. It's um it's a view from the back seat of a car, mm-hmm. looking through the windshield of the car, and Heineck and this Air Force officer who is apparently a composite of Edward Ruppelt and Hector Quintanilla, which is a real mind bender. Um, but it's <laughs> but it's Heineck and his Air Force compatriots sitting in the front seat of the car, sort of looking at each other. And there's what appears to be a flying saucer visible through the windshield of the car. Do you know what the picture I'm talking about? I'm looking at it right now. Okay. Well, look at the rearview mirror. I, yeah. I mean, the UFO. It's a rearview mirror. It's actually not a UFO. Right. And it, it took me several times looking at that picture to realize that that's what I was looking at. And I started <laughs> thinking, okay, so why would they put that little visual pun in there? They obviously want us to think it's a UFO. But they don't want it to actually. But it's actually not a UFO. So are they playing it safe? Are they being su- are they being a little too clever for their own good? I think I know. What do you? What's what's your theory? I'm curious. Well, and the other cool thing, and uh, kind of a little Easter egg in the picture, is that if you look at the reflection in the mirror, uh, you see the Lubbock lights, which is, I know is Uh-oh. a case that they're going to cover, but. Um, my guess is, knowing these production companies and how this sort of thing works, is that Project Blue Book doesn't have the word UFO in it. So they're trying as much as possible to get across the idea that, hey, guys, this is a UFO show. If you don't know what the hell Project Blue Book is or what that means, it, it's UFOs. This is We're going to be doing UFOs here. That's, that's what uh-huh. I'm guessing. Oh, I think that's a really good guess. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Does it? it are you? I'm old enough to remember this from my childhood, and I'm totally dating myself here. <laughs> but did you ever see the old, old Blue Book series, Project UFO? You know what? Was, I've uh, seen very little of it. Of course, I've heard about it. I've uh-huh. written about it because it, it was, you know, a big deal that they, they yeah, produced something like that. But it no. Well. So you saw okay, it. Well, yeah, I, I was, uh, I don't know, in my I can't remember when the show was on, like early 70s, I'm guessing. So I would have been like... 11 or 12 maybe when the show was on and of course i had to watch it oh my gosh there's a new show about ufos i have to watch it so but the but the show is incredibly disappointing because at the end at the end of every episode the air force guys who were about as dry and humorless as you can imagine at the end of every episode the air force guys proved that the ufo in question was simply a hoax or mistaken identity. Mm-hmm. It was never a spaceship. It was never anything of alien origin ever. They never went anywhere near that. So the show was ultimately very, very disappointing because it reinforced, <laughs> in my view, it reinforced the exact wrong message about the phenomenon. But it was a safe message, so that's what yeah. they went with. So 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 now you know. Fast forward to today, and now there's this new Blue Book series coming out, and it seems like they're they're veering off in the complete opposite direction, going heavily, very heavily into the, uh, uh, from what it looks like, going very heavily into the um, conspiracy theory and government uh, cover up storyline. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty interesting. Again. Um lacks some accuracy <laughs> but uh yeah. of course makes for a more compelling because they're kind of given an x-files uh yes. treatment to it it seems like so right, we exactly. are about out of time for this segment so we're going to be going to break here in a minute we'll be back with mark o'connell talking about alan Hynek, and i want to remind people you can go to amazon to get his book if you haven't yet of course i've strongly recommended this book and i still do the close encounters man how one man made the world believe in ufos anything well written and credible about Hynek is is really important because like i said i think he pro- might be um Definitely one of the most important stories when it comes to the history of UFOs, and that's what's kind of fun at 
at least they're focusing on him. So we'll talk more about the History Channel show. We'll talk more about um, Heineck himself and some of his favorite cases. And we'll be right back. For those of you listening to the podcast, you'll hear a short musical interlude. The rest of you will hear a commercial. If you're listening on KGRA, we'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Open Mind GFO Radio. This is your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I'm with author Mark O'Connell, who wrote um, this book on J. Allen Hynek, The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs. And we were talking about this new Project Blue Book show that the History Channel is um, uh, going to be airing here in the next few months and uh and it's it's kind of exciting but like you mentioned you didn't recognize anything when you saw it and it's kind of funny <laughs> in that they give this kind of x-files treatment and everything's dark you know dark rooms everything's happening yeah. in the dark and and when i think of Heineck, i think of the interviews and everything i've seen and which is totally opposite which is more like an engineer or a scientist in these brightly lit rooms with fluorescent lights, you know, and these jackets and, and pocket protectors and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, they have an artistic, uh, an artistic vision, I guess. Um, and we see a little of that, of that in the trailer. And, it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where, where they go with that. Mm-hmm. Now, so this is a hard part. Now, and... and I think we might have talked about this before, but of course you can clarify from from your knowledge and your interviews. Um, I've talked with uh, other people who worked with Heineck, and he was very disappointed in Close Encounters, Um, at least at first. uh, And there were several reasons, but one reason is like many researchers, they like their information or their research to be portrayed factually. And of course this was given another situation where it was given the Hollywood treatment. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of took the essence of the reports and the sightings, but portrayed, you know, no one sighting as it happened. And I mean, do you feel that way about uh, these TV shows or, or do you have more of a positive aspect uh, perspective? Well, I, I mean, there are so many TV series now that have that have been around over the last decade or so that have delved into um, UFO investigation, and you know, like most things, they're kind of hit or miss. There, there are some shows that um, one one that stood out to me was the series Close Encounters. I don't know if that's still in production now, but it was hmm. around for at least a season or two, and I was always very impressed with. That show, I thought they did a really good job of dramatizing the UFO events. I thought they brought in some interesting voices. Uh, one one of their regular experts was Dr. Mark Rodiger, who is mm. now the scientific director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. Yeah, he's great. Um, yeah, he is. So I thought, you know, the fact that they that they went to to Dr. Rodiger to be one of their guest experts, I thought, spoke highly of the show. So. You know, there are shows like that that I think are are really great and do a fantastic job of of portraying the phenomenon. And, you know, then there are other shows that I think are are just kind of bizarre and don't really help us out very much at all. There was one, I can't remember, I can't remember what it was called, but it had a trio of investigators looking into some case every week and it was always, it just became ridiculous. Uh, (laughs) I I I can't think of the names. it I think that, I know it, what show you're talking about, but I'm not going to say it. Yeah, I'm not going to say it either. <laughs> so we don't hurt <laughs> but any it was very, I will just say it was a very, very silly TV show. And the more they tried to make it dramatic, the sillier it got. And it, like yeah. I said, it, it didn't do the, 
science of ufology any favors. Mm -hmm. Another one I liked before we move on, and I think it was History Channel also, and it eventually became produced by John Greenwald, was UFO Files. Um, That one was was pretty good, too. I don't know that one. I don't know if I've seen that. But that one wasn't fiction. It was more documentary-based, whereas this one's more fiction. And, And you made a good point when we were talking earlier, is that, you know... Well, when I was in Comic Con, they had the activation, and uh, for people who I've told people this quite a bit, but I guess for you, if you wanted to, you could go to my Facebook videos, and you, I live streamed my walking through uh, and getting my little visit. I got a press tour of of the whole thing, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and there were, and on the website, they're kind of focusing on a few cases. Um, These cases being uh, the Lubbock Lights, like we talked about earlier, uh, Flatwoods Monster, where these these kids and this teacher, you know, saw this uh, UFO and then they saw this weird like robot type of thing. And then this dogfight with a UFO from 1948, where this guy Gorman um, had uh, he was flying a P-51 Mustang, but they were flying in like Korea and, and World War Two and and. He was actually in America when he had kind of this little dogfight or at least encounter with an object that outmaneuvered him. Surprise, surprise. That's a common occurrence. But you had a point that those are cases that um, Heineck may not have actually investigated. Yeah, yeah. What I had said was um, from from what I've read about the TV show, the first season is is takes place in the 1951 1951- to 1953 time frame. And during that time, really up until just the very beginning of 1953, Heineck Heineck was not actually investigating any UFO cases for the Air Force. He was simply sitting at his office at Ohio State University, and every couple of weeks, um, somebody would drive up from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where the Project Blue Book offices were, and would drop off uh, a bunch of files for Heineck to look at, all the latest case reports. And he would go through the files one by one, and he would read the witness accounts, and he would read the Air Force investigators' accounts. He would check his star charts and his records, and he would just make a notation on the case report that said, oh, this was really just Venus, this was a comet. Um, And as I point out in my book, he was always able to explain away about 80% of those uh, cases, but he never actually went out into the field to investigate any of those cases. So, so, and you had asked me, Alejandro, if there were like if there were any accounts of Heineck's involvement in those cases, and I couldn't think of any for just that reason, mm-hmm. because Heineck Heineck was really just desk bound at that time. It wasn't really until uh, the beginning of '53, and that was he was sent out to investigate a, a, an event that took place in 1952 um, in uh, in South Dakota and North Dakota, um, where some uh, military uh, military ground observers who were watching for approaching Soviet warplanes, Soviet bombers, um, saw some strange lights in the sky and tracked them uh, over the course of several hours in the course of one night when these things moved from uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, up to Bismarck, North Dakota, about 200 miles away, and were seen by a whole bunch of trained observers. Uh, and it was a re- that case was a real puzzler for Project Blue Book. Um, and Edward Ruppelt, who was the director at the time, um, wanted to go investigate, but he was actually on his way out. He was being transferred out, and I, and I think at that point, retiring. Uh, and so Heineck was the only person manning the Blue Book office, essentially. So he was sent out uh, on Ruppelt's recommendation. Heineck was actually sent out to South Dakota and North Dakota, and that was his first field investigation. Wow, interesting. See, that's really interesting information, too. That Really, he didn't get in his... He roll up his sleeves and get out into the field until 53, although he was involved all the way up from, what, 47 or 48? Uh, yeah, I think it was 48 when he actually got involved when he was hired to be take part in Project Sign, which was the first of the three Air Force uh, studies. Um, and, and, and his work with Project Sign was almost like, you know, blink your eyes and you miss miss it. <laughs> he basically, the... the, the um, the project had all but wrapped up, but by the time Heineck became involved, 
and he just basically got a stack of a few hundred case reports, wrote in his uh, his case disposition, and sent them all back to Wright Patterson. And then he was, as far as he was concerned, he was done with UFOs permanently um, until a couple of years later when those same guys from Wright Patterson came knocking on his door again and said, uh, "Hey, we need your help again." Mm-hmm. What I find interesting also is I've written some stories where there were some incidents. A lot of people feel, uh, which is true, and Anne Heineck talks about this at the you know the Air Force wasn't as into investigating, but at times, especially if you read Rupelt's book, you know the level of of uh, seriousness or or effort put into the investigation waned depending on who was working on it at the time. And the politics and everything going on. And I have found some cases where the Air Force stuck with this is an unknown, despite um, Heineck saying, nope, I think we've figured it out. I think this is what it is. And the Air Force disagreed with him uh, and kept it as an unknown. And and those are some really interesting cases. Oh, I bet. I, and I... I confess, I'm not familiar with those cases. I would love to know more sometime. Yeah, so there's a few of those. I think people uh, can look this up, but when it comes to unknown, um, Heineck kept his his own list of what he felt were unknown, separate from what the Air Force uh, declared in their final reports as unknown. And, and of course, there were even more where Heineck felt they were genuine unknowns, but the Air Force kind of dismissed them. Yeah, definitely. So... Uh, so that's one uh, aspect. Of course, the show is trying to portray Blue Book and using, you know, Heineken and, and this other guy as, as vehicles to, um, you know, run the whole gamut and probably portray some of the better cases, hopefully accurately. But uh, when it came to Heineken getting involved with field work, what were some of the more um, – impactful investigations he was on that le- left an impression well the one i was just describing the one in south dakota and north dakota mm-hmm. uh, made a huge impression on him because it, he um rupelt had actually gone out and inve- made a very brief investigation of the case um before he retired um but heineck went out and stick st- actually stuck around for a couple of days and interviewed everyone and just found uh, found Rupelt's conclusions completely completely groundless. Uh, he disagreed <laughs> entirely with what his what his boss had reported. So that that was kind of a big deal because you know up until then Heineck was just kind of Mr. Go Along Get Along. He did what the Air Force told him. He you know he made the boss happy, and now he goes out on his first field investigation and. Uh, completely contradicts what his what his boss had already decided was was going on out there so that was that was to me that was a dramatic moment in Heineck's development as a UFO investigator you know when he reached this point when he was actually brave enough to uh, you know cross his Air Force uh, commander that was that was kind of a big deal um, and then you know going th- going through the 50s I guess that you know the next real big one was um, uh, the level and lights that's a that's a sighting that really fascinates me and that that stuck out for Heineck because he di- he dismissed the uh, the level and uh, lights originally because he was so involved with the sp- with the satellite tracking system at the time developing that that he didn't really have the time or the patience to look very closely at the UFO reports that the Air Force was sending him so so when the Air Force dismissed the level and lights as, you know, just illusions or astronomical events, Heineck, Heineck just agreed with that. And then later on, when he had a chance to go over that case file again, he really regretted that he had endorsed the Air Force's judgment because he realized that, um, oh, I know what it was. The Air Force said it was ball lightning. They said it was ball lightning. And Heineck went back later and said, you know what, I never should have agreed with them. It obviously wasn't ball lightning. Um, and I, just to, just for your listeners who aren't familiar with the case, it was this this one night in uh, in uh, Leveland, Texas, where over 15 different motorists had their cars die um, when they saw this gigantic egg-shaped UFO, glowing egg-shaped UFO, either landed in the road ahead of them or hovering ahead of them over the road. Um, and all of these drivers kept calling the local police department and saying, you know, reporting, oh, my gosh, my, you know, my car died. 
And then when this thing flew away, my car started up again. And I think that was that was also influ- influential with Heineck because he ended up he ended up really uh, placing a great importance on those close encounters of the second kind cases. And those are close encounters cases where the where the unidentified object actually has a, a physical effect on um, people and objects in its in its uh, you know its in its influence. So here you've got this this strange glowing egg shaped thing that has shown up on the road 15 times and knocked out the engines and the headlights of all these vehicles. And Heineck really, really took a liking to those close encounters of the second case, second kind cases, because there was actual physical evidence. You know, there was actually some scientific value to those cases. Mm hmm. Yeah, I know another case that was important for him, and and I believe he got in the field for this one as well. Is is the Lonnie Zamora case? That's oh what yeah, it make reminds me of because the the shape of the craft and, and even it's it's what it did is kind of similar to what you described here in this Texas case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The old egg shaped UFO. I've always been fascinated by those because they don't come up very often. Mm-hmm. Um, the, yeah, and the the funny thing about the Leveland was it, Leveland craft. Everyone described it as looking kind of the same, but the estimates of its size were all over the place, as I recall. You know, one person said it, it was like 50 feet across, and another person said it was 200 feet across. So I, I always thought that was a really curious aspect of the case, because everything else about their testimony um, jibes. Everything else is, is um, consistent throughout all, the, all these reports except for the size of the craft. Mm-hmm. So does that mean the craft was changing size, or does it mean that there was more than one, or does it just mean that people are really bad at estimating the size of things mm-hmm. under stress? Who knows, but it's a really fascinating case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, you might find this interesting as a preface to, to my next question uh, to kind of get back into the show in the last few minutes that we have, uh, is that... Uh, I've heard that uh, one of the responses that um, Jacques Vallée has had, Jacques Vallée, of course, who was kind of a protege of Heineck, um, and when he saw the trailers for the show, he was like, he kind of was like you. I don't see anything similar here. You know, they talk about how it was a secret project. None of it was secret. None of this looks accurate to me. So he had an issue (laughs) with that part. And... You brought up another part that seems to be, you know, where they're taking some artistic license, which is this whole conspiracy part. Um, And and it seems like the men in black are going to be a part of this, but kind of like somehow nefariously trying to keep information from Hynek um, because he doesn't have access to all the information type of thing. But as far as I know, and, and Hynek didn't feel that way. Or did he? Ah, that's the <laughs> oh, you saved a trick question for the very end. <laughs> but, you know, it, that's that's Alejandro. That's as you know, that's a really tough question to answer because, um, you know, publicly, Heineck would deny that there was any of that kind of skullduggery going on. But but then there were also times when you know in 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 a private conversation with a with a colleague or a friend he would say something that suggested that you know there was something to this conspiracy theory i i reported one of these incidences in my book when uh Heineck was visiting with his his old friend and colleague Jenny Zeidman in Ohio in uh, i believe it was the late 70s and um just sort of made this casual mention to his friend uh Jenny that um you know, that there was really something real going on with the, this UFO thing and that it was really, you know, it, it was it was um, something totally unexpected. Uh, but he wouldn't say anything more. They were at, they were at an awards lunch hmm. because Heineck's book had just been awarded an Ohio Literary Prize. Um, so Heineck just sort of dumped this little bombshell uh, just minutes before going up to give his speech, and he never spoke to her about it again. So she was always left wondering, well, now, was he pulling my leg? Or was he, you know, was he trying to get me interested in looking into this? She she was never really sure. Hmm. So, then, yeah, it's it's a complicated, it's a yeah. complicated issue. And it, it's, it's, as I mentioned in the book, even in the end, even a lot of his friends 
never really quite knew the real answers about about Hynek's involvement. Yeah, I, I and I've heard that from people familiar with him too, because they answer the question kind of similar to you. That um, they don't. He publicly said, you know, there was nothing to that, but he always he hinted sometimes that maybe. So maybe he was curious himself. And mm-hmm. when you look at the Bolander memo, with this this memo when they closed Project Blue Book, uh, they were asked. They were essentially alerting people, "Hey, we're closing Blue Book." And and one of the generals wrote, "Well." We send the important reports somewhere else anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Essentially saying they already have a mechanism for looking at unknowns, and which, of course, they should, because, of course, yeah, these yeah. could turn out to be foreign technology. But um, that also alludes to, who knows, it's possible. I mean, as UFO researchers or people in this field, none of us knew about this organization that we just found out about in December, even though many, including myself, especially myself, was heavily interacting with many of the people involved. Uh huh. So who knows, huh? Y- y- well, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's endlessly fascinating. Maybe the I, History I, Channel I... knows something we don't. <laughs> well, we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> yeah. I guess. <laughs> who knows who knows history channel might trigger disclosure once yeah. and for all yeah we'll see <laughs> wouldn't that be fun well thank you so much for coming on the show again uh especially right now with this new uh project coming up and we'll definitely have to have you on once the show starts uh i know i'm gonna be writing uh like weekly on every episode for the den of geek uh website Oh, great. And so, yeah, I'll be knee-deep in it, which is fun because I'm excited about it. It looks like, I mean, they also have done Vikings, which is a great show. So I think at the very least it's going to be very entertaining. And it might be, you know, the new X-Files, but at least it'll be based on a real character that hopefully will bring awareness. And hopefully your book sales will go through the roof because, you know, then it'll bring – awareness to what really happened back then and it's a fascinating story Heineck's story i think well well you know at at the uh, at the at the comic-con presentation the actor aiden gillen who's portraying dr Heineck, apparently he told the crowd that he read my book as part of his inspiration oh and really i wish i would have been role. at that so i feel like aiden anytime you want to plug my book that's <laughs> fine with me <laughs> well you know what i'm gonna be sure and, and maybe I'll even contact you if I get an interview with him, which I probably will at some point. Oh. I'll ask him that question and verify that. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, for sure, because I would be too. fascinated to know that. <laughs> yeah. That Okay, you got a deal. I can't wait to find out. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, thank you. People can go to Amazon to get your book, The Close Encounters Man. Is there anything else you want to plug before we go? My blog, HighStrangenessUFO.com. All right, and uh, and yeah, Amazon or your local Barnes and Noble or any independent bookseller in All the right. land. Yep, everybody's going on Amazon these days, huh? But yeah, don't forget your mom, pa bookstore. Exactly, we got to support them too. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Alejandro. It's been fun. Thank you so much to Mark for being on the show again. He just chose such an awesome topic for his book. We'll definitely need to have him back uh, yet again um, as the show on Blue Book progresses and we see how they, you know, actually portray Hynek. So his book, The Close Encounters Man, of course, um, Hynek was a guy that came up with a Close Encounters scale. Close Encounters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, you know, that's why he um, was a consultant for Spielberg's movie called That. I also want to thank Martin Willis with Podcast UFO for joining us. Uh, Go to openminds.tv to see all the stories that Martin and I talked about. Also, just some updates, UFO Congress. You can go there and check out the story. You can also find it at openminds.tv. We've got really cool new shirts, and we have glow-in-the-dark alien hats. They're super cool. Check it out at ufocongress.com. Otherwise, I want to thank Micah... 
I want to thank Caleb Hanks for the open and close music. He is Micah Hanks' brother, who does the Graylian Report, who actually I'll be joining in September at Devil's Tower. We're both speaking at a UFO conference. And so is Mark D'Antonio, and so is Lee Spiegel, and lots of other cool people. So check that out as well. And then finally, of course, I want to thank um, Systematics, who creates that bumper music. And as always, I want to thank you, the listener. Um, over the next few days, we're going to have, or weeks and months, we're going to have more radio shows. And of course, we've got UFOs Seriously Live. So check that out on our YouTube channel. Until next time, people, adios, muchachos. 